Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this evening, uh, the Visions and Voices co-sponsored event with the Institute for Theater and Social Change. My name is Dr. Brent Blair. I'm the director of the Institute for Theater and Social Change at the School of Dramatic Arts, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the Daughters of the Movement event. I'm so happy you're here. Uh, the Institute provides a research and development forum for expressive and interactive dramatic arts practices relative to education, therapy, and social justice that disrupts oppression and engages communities in meaningful dialogue for social change. And that's why we're so happy to have this conversation with this group of extraordinary women tonight. I'd like to now introduce our Masters of uh, Public Policy student, Anna Cockrell, who will deliver the land acknowledgement. Visions and Voices program acknowledges that USC was built on the sacred land of the Tongva Nation. The colonization of this land reflects the systems of power upon which this country was founded and which continue to operate today. We honor the Tongva and all indigenous people, past, present, and future, and their continued survival and contributions to society. We also honor the legacy of the African diaspora and recognize that this country would not exist without the free enslaved labor of black people. We know that contemporary struggles for black lives are connected to our history of violence and white supremacy. We share these acknowledgements to pay respect to the original caretakers of this land, to raise awareness about histories that are too often erased or forgotten, to recognize our place in this history and to affirm our commitment to social change. Please take a moment to feel the ground underneath your feet and honor the land. Thank you, and I'll turn the mic back over back to Dr. Blair. Thank you very much, Anna. So now it's my great honor to introduce the moderator for our event this evening. This is Dr. Kim Tavari. Dr. Kim Tavari has a passion for racial, social, and healing justice. Born in Guyana, South America, Kim has, lived the, has the lived experience as an immigrant who later became a U.S. citizen. Kim grew up in Brooklyn most of her life and found her way to Cali in 2000. She holds a doctorate degree in educational leadership and has worked at a variety of institutions, both public and private. She's also one of the founding members of our Institute for Theater and Social Change. Kim is an activist with Black Lives Matter Long Beach chapter and works with local community groups fighting for human dignity and freedom for black people. She's also a mom to a 14 year old teenage son and a certified yoga teacher. Kim spent every Saturday of the pandemic teaching her black girl magic yoga to her community on Zoom. Currently, Kim works at the USC Equity Research Institute overseeing their racial justice and organizational development work, and she is a great friend. It's my pleasure, Kim, to welcome you to this space. Thank you, Brent, for that warm introduction and welcome to our wonderful guests, to our students, staff, faculty, community and family members watching on Zoom. Let's just take a quick look at a short video to meet our guests. Okay, so how do we all come together? So I called you, Gina. Right. Right. And then I called you, Keisha, because I felt at that moment in time, I needed a sisterhood. Right. And I think for everyone here, they felt they needed some type of system. So my first instinct immediately when you called me was like, Suzanne. Like, I got to call Suzanne. I had nominated. Right? Suzanne. Suzanne. <laughs> and then we were like, let's call Hesna. Because not only is it just, you know, for me, the need for, for us to gather as women mm -hmm. and have a sisterhood in that way, but also for us, because we have such a common experience in our lives. That people love to know, you know, how we, our families and how we are right. connected. It is our responsibility to support one another. So I think yeah. that when we think about our parents, that each one of our parents felt that way. My lesson, one of my lessons from my grandfather, is that is how we as a people you know, elevate. I didn't realize that, yes, your mother actually kind of mentored my mother. There was a big sister relationship there. I had no idea wow. about that. And that definitely your mother did as well. We have a really special opportunity because we've been groomed by very special people. Ooh, yes. And not only are we relishing in our own sisterhood and helping ourselves, but we have such an opportunity to help others.
Wow, I am so deeply humbled and honored. Just quite frankly, a little speechless, which is new for me. <laughs> so before we get into this conversation, let me just set the scene a little bit. After all, this is co-sponsored by the Institute for Theater and Social Change. So if you just imagine this in your, in your mind's eye, a brownstone in Harlem, it's spring, the weather is a little cool, it's a little chilly outside, a group of Black women are having dinner together, women whose parents are instrumental or were instrumental to the civil rights movement. There's a playful feeling in the air, there's joy, there's laughter. These women, like their parents, have dedicated their lived experience to the liberation of Black people. So of course, you know, when we get together, there's a spread of food, right? So imagine again, we've got a spread of delicious food, black eyed peas and rice, a basket of fried fish, cornbread, mac and cheese, barbecue chicken, of course, there's barbecue tofu sticks for the non-meat eaters, right? Garlic, mashed potatoes and the like. So ladies, take a seat, bless the food and let's dig in. Yes. So let, let me kick it off to Stacy. Stacy, can you tell us a little bit about you know, this amazing gift of Black women in community. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, first, let me start by saying every time I see that video, I get so emotional. Um, you know, <laughs> we started this organization, uh, which, and to call it an organization is surreal right now. Uh, we started this organization in 2017. And you know, when you have something so good, that it doesn't even feel like four years, it feels like yesterday, right? Um, in 2013, I um, went through a very rough period in my life. Um, you know, I broke up with, with my boyfriend of like seven years. Uh, my dog passed away. I had my dog for like 10 years. And the most, I would say emotionally, crippling thing happened. My father passed away in 2013. And my dad, Bill Lynch, um, was not just my daddy, but a phenomenal organizer uh, and campaign manager to David N. Dinkins, the first African-American mayor of New York City, as well as the senior advisor to folks like Nelson Mandela and Hillary Clinton. And it felt like the world had just dropped. And, um, you know, while I have a wonderful family and supportive friends, I felt like I needed a sisterhood. And so I reached out to Gina Bilafonte and I said, hey, I had this idea. Um, you know, I want to convene a dinner with my sisters. Are you down? And she was like, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt, right? <laughs> and Gina called Hesna and Suzanne. And, uh, you know, I also reached out to Keisha and Keisha said the exact same thing. And Keisha reached out to Dominic and Ilyasa. And we also had, you know, quite a few other sisters at that dinner. And we started to have like monthly dinners, supporting each other, talking about sisterhood, and creating this really incredible safe space. And, you know, Kim, um, this support system has done so much for me. Um, and, you know, I can't take credit for creating this. I think we created it together, right? Mm -hmm. um, because mm -hmm. clearly we needed this form of sisterhood to kind of support each other. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that's my story. I'm, I'm so happy to be here tonight and, and to join this conversation with my sisters. Feel free to jump in everyone. This is a conversation. Okay, cool, then I will. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, yeah, so Stacy reached out and um, we, as she said, we had a few of these dinners and what started to sort of happen is there were a few of us that just kept really coming to all of them and different sisters would come in and out. And then um, actually Stacy, we, we kind of looked at each other. I think it was, and, 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 and we were like, I think we've got something here. She yeah. was like, I think we have something here. And so um, <clears throat> the seven of us 
came together more intentionally yeah and started to build upon this concept of a uh, a sisterhood that would be able to draw from the legacies that we all have and then sort of bring forward not only the history of those legacies because we all are interwoven we're like a big quilt uh of, of families that have come together and intersected in so many different ways. And now in some ways, um, even though throughout our years, different pairs of us have known each other more consistently, but we now um, you know, share the same kind of connectivity as our parents did and how our parents came together and supported each other in, in various different ways. And so, um, uh, I too am excited for this conversation and so happy that we're all here tonight. And thank you to USC for, for bringing us here today. Yes, thank you, thank you. And I wanna pivot just a little bit to bring Ilyasa into this conversation. Um, as one of the six daughters of Malcolm X and Dr. Betty Shabazz, you, you yourself had five other siblings, five other sisters. So what's it like being in this configuration of sisterhood? Uh oh. You're muted, Ellie. Mute. <laughs> I like that sweater, by the way. It is nice. <laughs> while, you're, while you're unmuting. Yeah, it's very nice. <laughs> Checking it out. You're still muted. Uh oh. Oh. Playing somewhere else. There, there you oh, go. No. There you are. <laughs> but, you know, um, I'm accustomed to this, you know this whole sisterhood thing. Um, in my household, we had two uh, women who were sisters, they were elders and, and they stayed with us when my mother was getting her um, degrees and stuff. And so there were six daughters, there was my mother, seven, and then the two, Ms. Hopgood and Ms. Thomas. And so there were nine women, so I'm accustomed to it. And where, whenever I go anywhere, I always tell people that I am one of six daughters because my father was just about six, five, mother, about five, nine. They had 12 children who were very opinionated and women. And I think what happens is you learn how to um, be a good sister friend, right? And you learn how to recognize the same in others. And, and so I'm so grateful to have this opportunity to be with these dynamic women, you know, who have become sort of a surrogate sister, you know, um, surrogate sisters, and that we hold one another up, that we share our joys, we share our trepidations. Um, and, and it's just so important um, when we look at even those women um, who, upon whose shoulders we stand, they also had a sisterhood. When we look at the sororities, they have sisterhood. When we look at these organizations, right, the sisterhood is extremely important. And, and so I'm so grateful to um, Stacy for coming, for Gina Belafonte, um, who has a handsome dad that, you know, we're always whispering about. Right. I'm so <laughs> grateful. I mean, each of these women are dynamic. Dominique, the youngest, Hesna, whose father eulogized my father. And, you know, we would be out at dinner and I would just find myself sort of just like staring, you know, at her, <laughs> you, you know, and Suzanne, whose mom is Diane Carroll. Right. But what's most important is that each of us understands this, um, you know, sacred bond that we have, that, that there is this element of trust, you know, and we understand, you know, there were often times where we couldn't open up and reveal our inner, you know, selves, but when we're with one another, we feel just that comfort um, of trust, you know, where we can open up our feelings. And so I'm just super, super grateful, you know, to have been one of six daughters, which prepared me to be one of seven. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I love awesome. that. Awesome. Thank love you. That, Thank you awesome. so much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Dominique, what about so let's, you? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no worries. I just want to shift gears a little bit to, to, to talk to our students and our faculty and our staff. We're in an educational institution watching us here. And just wanting to ask Keisha and Suzanne maybe to weigh in on this. How important was education to you all growing up? And just tell us a little bit about that. 
Um, education. I'll go first, Keish, if you want. <laughs> I just jumped yeah, in. I can go. Um, and, and I apologize that I can't put my camera on right now. Uh, love y'all anyway. <laughs> but um, education is really interesting because I was given a very good education by America's standards in that I went to, you know, Wesleyan University and then I went to Columbia Journalism, la, la, la. And I went to school in Switzerland one year. Um, but when I heard our youngest sister, Dominique, talking about how Ilyasa's mother made sure, I'm telling your story, you can tell your story, made sure that she went, when she was young, into the education of understanding who we are as people. Um, and that was her foundation. I was jealous <laughs> because I went to these institutions that stripped me of that. And if I didn't, and then my mother was incredibly busy and it's really hard to parent and fill in all the holes, especially for our history, which she wasn't taught. You know, and it wasn't a day where she had time to sit down and like do the work that, you know, John Hope Franklin did or something, you know, like how was she supposed to know all that? So she couldn't pass that on to me. So my education about who we are as people came at my own hand in my 50s. I would say I finally began, maybe, is that right? Maybe in my late 40s, I began to say, what the hell have they kept from me? Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe that's because I had children. And I was going to put my children in some of these primarily white institutions. I had made that choice and I knew I had to buffer. I had to protect them. I had to give them another version of history. So I would say I'm grateful. It taught me how to think. It's a great, these were great institutions. Not everybody gets access like this. I'm not putting them down. They were amazing, but they will they back in my day. And I still think they do the same thing now because my kids are in those schools. They will rob you of who you are if you don't have another way to to figure that out so that's my answer about education <laughs> thank you for that thank you for that uh keisha i'm going to pass you the, ma the mac and cheese what, what's your what, what is your what's your say <laughs> oh bless you if only you knew that i'm not allowed to eat dairy until saturday sunday now it's, now it's vegan it's dairy. vegan <laughs> I get oh, vegan. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, so, so education is a huge part of my family's values. Um, my, my grandfather, my, my, um, I'm going to, if you permit me one um, kind of indulgence into my family's history, my grandfather, his name was Percy Sutton. Um, and he was the youngest of 15 children his parents were, Percy Sutton is well known for all the rock star things that he did with the Apollo and running for mayor and WBLS and being Elias's dad's attorney and Tuskegee Airmen, but his parents were the rock stars. So his parents, they had 15 children, just start right there, because um, I've had two and I can't imagine having 15 people live and come through my body. Um, <laughs> but then what was really miraculous is, so he was born in 1920 in San Antonio, Texas, 15 children, 10 of them lived to adulthood. I'm sorry, excuse me, 12 of them lived to adulthood. All 12 children born between 1897 and 1920 in San Antonio, Texas, black folks, all, all 12 had college degrees. Seven of them did graduate studies. Four of them finished their graduate studies. My grandfather became an attorney. His brother was an attorney, became a judge. Uh, his eldest brother was worked was a scientist who worked with George Washington Carver on the uses of the peanut um, and, and went to Russia uh, in his stead. And his eldest sister was one of the first women to graduate from Howard's Medical School uh, and became a pediatrician uh, who had her own practice in, in New Jersey. So education was drilled into me uh, in terms of I, I must excel in that space. Um, I too, like Suzanne, had that same feeling when I heard Dominique dis describing her um, her experience growing up. My education in terms of our culture and uh, our experience as a, as a people was from the mouths of my of my grandfather, my mother, my my father, who was very much a revolutionary. I was taught my family's history, or not my family, my people's history orally uh, in much the same way that I try to do with my children. So anything that, you know, when we watch television and 
uh, you know, anything that's happening in politics or what have you, my kids are always going, mom, why does everything have to be about blackness? Why, like, why does it have to be like, and I'm like, because you need to understand what you're seeing in the context of the total story, in the context of the history. And um, so I teach all of that, you know, I give all that backstory that they may not, when you see something on the surface, you may not understand. And then I pause the TV or pause whatever we're doing and say, this is the backstory behind A, A B, C, and X, Y, and Z. And um, so that my family, my my kids can, you know, have uh, a moment to to indulge in or to to absorb in the way that I was able to absorb. And then my other education was growing up in Harlem, you know, uh, surrounded by my people and in the Apollo Theater, which is quite an education. <laughs> yes, in of itself. Yes, yes. Indeed. Dominique. Dominique, so they both mentioned you. Do you want to do you want to share some words? <laughs> oh, well, briefly. Okay, so just a short story. So Ilyasa's mom, Dr. Betty Shabazz, was mine and my sister. I have a sister who's 14 months younger than me, Ashley. So she was mine and my sister Ashley's godmother. And uh, I was born in 1986. I was born in a, a very um a somewhat uh, controversial time, of course, in the city of New York. When my father was fighting the powers that be. And he was very controversial uh, during re the late re 80s. Remind us who your dad is? My father is Reverend Al Sharpton. Okay. And I'm the oldest of two, two daughters. Um, and born in 86, my sister's born in 87. So my godmother, um, when we were of age to go to school, um, my mother, first of all, was in the military. She was, a, she was a sergeant in the US military for 15 years. So we went to school on the base in Fort Hamilton. And so we were able to, you know, go to pre-K, kindergarten. I believe at that time it was kindergarten. There was no universal pre-K at the time. Um, and so when we were, it was time for us to go to kindergarten, Dr. Shabazz had a conversation with my parents and said, well, look, now you can't put them in public school. Like you're all over the news, you're doing God knows what, you know, you gotta put them in an institution that's gonna teach them who they are so that when they get older and they um, understand what you do and what they're about, they will know who they are, no matter what comes their way. And I'm so glad that my parents listened to her. Uh, we went to, uh, at the time it was called Wayusi Shule, and it was a school um, centered around African culture and education. So we learned um, letter, uh, logic and rhetoric. We recited and learned all about uh, African culture. The teachers spoke to us in Yoruba, French, and in English. Um, and we just, we were engulfed and enriched in um, African culture. Um, we learned about the continent, we learned about the culture, and then we learned about how we, as people of color, got to the United States, and we understood what that meant, and all of the complexities and intricacies that went along with that. And I learned all of this before I was in, by the time I was in eighth grade and ready to go to high school, you know, I was well equipped with, you know, who, who I was as a Black woman, or who I would be developed to become as a Black woman, because I knew all about you know, our culture and where my roots uh, lie. Um, and mm -hmm. so when I went to uh, Poly Prep for high school, which is a predominantly white private school, um, and I was confronted, I was now the minority um, and also being a minority whose last name was Sharpton, it was not very easy being in a prep school. So um, I, I think that I was able to accept the challenge that came with, you know, being in a, a private school and having the last name Sharpton. And um, I was able to push forward and excel. And I did amazing things in the school. Um, I found my, um, my, my acting um, a creative um, 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 outlet. Um, at Poly. And then I evolved and went to college and conservatory and, and forward. But education um, was something that was important to my parents. I was the first person in my immediate family to graduate from college. Um, so education was important, but it was just not something that my parents always enforced in us. They didn't, they didn't, they told us, you know, you need to learn who you are and learn how to get along with everyone, uh, not just with people of color and not just with others, but you need to learn everyone and learn the world. Um, so they were more, um, you know, 
involved in us socially and 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 how that developed us um, mm-hmm. culturally mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so so education was important, but it wasn't something that was beat up over our head. We were um, we were taught to you know, to be respectful. We were taught to how to, how to socially deal with people, how to culturally deal with people and how to stand our ground and how to be ourselves and what that looks like in any space that we showed up in any room that we showed up in. Um, and I think I did all right with that. (laughs) Yes, you did. Yes, you did. (laughs) So you all are also starting to talk a little bit about activism, right? You're all doing some amazing work in your own spaces. And maybe Gina can kick us off at this conversation as the executive director of Sankofa, which was started by your father, Harry Belafonte. How do you know if your work today has impact? And, you know, what is that work that you're doing? Oh, thank you for for asking. Um, It's interesting. I, I, I wasn't really prepared to speak about Sankofa, but happy to always. Um, you know, it's interesting, um, because we work in the intersection of art and activism. And what I've learned to really understand very deeply is that it's very hard to quantify the impact of art and culture. You just don't know other than fans, you know, you just don't know the kind of emotional or intellectual impact that, you know, hearing a song with certain kinds of lyrics that speak to your heart, that move you to either act or move you to feel in some certain way. And then in this day and age, one of the things that's um, helped a tremendous amount is technology. So now with the uh, capacity to organize and to promote and to put out messages around uh, issues that we are constantly confronted with in the black and brown community, you can see who's responding and you can see who is um, wanting to engage because <clears throat> the uh, social media machine has assisted us in getting a deeper understanding um, on who's participating and why. Um, so Sankofa.org is a nonprofit organization founded by, like, like you said, my father, myself and Raul Roach. We founded in, 19, in uh, 19 in 2013 and um we saw that there was a need in the cultural community as well as in the grassroots organizing community to find ways in which to almost institutionalize the work that many of our parents did together here Hesna's mom and dad uh, Suzanne's mom as cultural leaders in the space certainly um Keisha's grandfather provided platforms for many of our uh, parents to come forward and expose our, expose, expose themselves and their points of view. So um, we founded this organization. We work with artists, thought leaders in partnership with grassroots organizations, and we focus on mass incarceration and juvenile justice, income disparity, We focus on immigration and we also focus on violence so that we can respond in a cultural way and use art as a tool to talk about issues of of violence, whether it's war, domestic violence, eco-violence. And um, it's been a really interesting ride. There's a lot of, as you can imagine, since we started, there are a lot of people, young artists that have come forward to use their platforms more vocally. Now, this has been happening for years. We see things like we are the world, hands across America, um, you know, Live Aid, Farm Aid, all of these really great, amazing spaces and places. But now, even more than ever before, we're seeing things like 13th, we're seeing things like Judah and the Black Messiah, we're seeing other ways in which culture is being used to tell our stories so that we can see ourselves reflected in this incredible and beautiful content. And it's also not not only giving us an opportunity to question our history and to perhaps go even deeper to get the, 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 the deeper truth of what happened during those times, um, but also it's inspiring us to see how we can make shift and change. And, and that's why Sankofa is around. It's really to motivate, activate, and educate folks mm, mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. And, and change. And I can't tell you how two individuals who are very, very close with my 
mother and father who I always look to their activism and the way that they use their platform because um, and it was interesting because one of my sisters who's who I'm who I'm referring to her parents she said you know my parents weren't like really out front out front and it's so interesting to have to have to hear her and I'm talking about Hesna to hear her describe her parents in that way because it's true but in the same for me they were front and center because I think that the subtlety and the way in which they use their platform, so impactful, so impactful. People gravitate to different kinds of leadership. And, um, and Hasna, I'll let you speak about your parents, certainly. But, um, and thank you for asking about Sankofa, which is you know so dear to my heart. And I work so hard to keep it going and make sure that you know, artists are, are given opportunity and platform and spaces where they can speak their truth to their fan base, but it's not their normal concert or their normal film or their, their normal, normal television show, but finding other ways to engage art as a tool. Right, right. Yeah, we'll, co we'll come back to that, but I want to bring Hesna in for this. And as you passed me the Black Eyed Peas, let's come into this conversation about uh, activism in your, in your world. Sure. Um, what Gina re is, is referring to is my parents' unwavering response to the call of the people. They always responded when um, Harry, and Harry was always calling. To, no, let's He's go. calling my mom go. too. Yeah. Calling everybody. Oh, and, 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 just in case you don't know, Hesna's parents. And Hesna, I was going to say, I was, was just. I'm yeah, sorry. tell us who your parents are before oh, you start yeah. talking. <laughs> um, and I often say that my father has an FBI file because he knows my mother, because uh, my mother was very fierce. But we responded to the call all of the time. And um, they instilled in us the value of speaking up, standing up, speaking out and demanding what we needed and what we deserve. And their approach was um, quite diplomatic, my dad more than my mom. Um, but the thing that they valued was doing things with grace, doing things in a way that would enable people to engage and to talk. And there's all types of ways to, to be activists and to activate people. And if, you know, with us on the call, we each represent all facets, many facets of those responsibilities from the attorneys to the funders, to the um, people out front, the organizers, uh, and, and also those who changed the image of African-American people Martin Luther King said that one of the greatest things that uh, the civil rights movements of the 50s and 60s did was to give African-Americans a better sense of themselves. And that came from the roles that Diane Carroll took and the roles that, that my parents took and, 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 and Gina's dad and mom as well. Uh, and that was just as significant as the legislation that was passed. So, um, my parents were always out in the street. We talked about education and how we got educated. And I had that education similar to uh, Dominique where that was always our conversation. There was no, I mean, I, I would go into the library in my own home and read. And not only could I read Du Bois, I could read Tolstoy, you know? So it, it, there, I, I don't ever recall, I, I would have gotten in trouble <laughs> if I didn't know my history you know, because they talked about it so much relative to the education. So um, my parents, I think in the work that they did and in their ad advocacy for and support of the people, they, they engaged in art and activism. And we like, my brother and sister and I, we like to say uh, in reference to them, love art and activism because their love was such a um, major component of who they were and what they represent. And, uh, you know, art is that, that's what affirms 
your experience. Art affirms an experience and it's a necessary component of activism. And um, that's one of the things that they, they brought to bear as well. You know, they, they did different things. They were co-hosted, co-hosted, co-moderated the, um, co-emceed the March on Washington and um, did other things that I think put a mark on the, on the, uh, on the movement. And mm -hmm. we're proud mm -hmm. of it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Hesna didn't mention that her field has been in education as well. That's, that's. Oh yeah. Absolutely, uh, uh, I'm an educator and uh, what I have grown to believe from uh, being a child to, to now is that education is justice. You cannot have justice without education. And it is the antidote to the ignorance that we are encountering now. And if we talk about the messages to your USC uh, student body, it is to hold on and to grasp on to the opportunity that they find themselves in, the resources that they have, the, the access that they have, and to sop it up like gravy, take a biscuit and sop that up, seeing that mm. way we're eating, and not to be um, uh, shy or reluctant or timid about speaking up when they don't see themselves, who, whoever they are. S students must speak up when they don't see themselves and they can't let it lay. They can't just let it go. Um, in their textbooks, in the um, links that they put, in the movies that are shown, in the conversations that are had, in the examples that are given in art and in everywhere, they must see themselves and they must stand up and speak clearly and loudly and make sure that they are represented. And if they don't know the questions to ask or they don't know the people who should be in their books, uh, I'm sure that the uh, administrators and the academic instructors will find a way to get that information. And if that can't happen, then they should get credit for doing the research and adding it to the curriculum. Yeah. Um, yes, so yes. That, that's my little spiel about it. <laughs> no, that is, right, that is right on time. I mean, cultural pedagogy is 100% needed. Stacey? I just have to say, Dr. Muhammad, an in <laughs> antidote to the ignorance that we are in. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> And yeah. if I can just add, this is not brilliant or anything. I just need people to know that when she said, when she said, love art activism, y'all need to go Google black couple goals and you will see her parents. <laughs> that is the image of black couple goals. So if you didn't already know, go, go Google her parents uh, so you can understand the love that existed between this couple they are literally every single person, every single black couple's uh, vision of what they want in their lives. And, and frankly, when we get to hear Hesna talk about her family unit and that which happened, like how they moved it. I'm a, I'm a child of divorced parents. And when I hear, I mean, the, to contrast the divorce, the, the only child of divorced parents experience. Keisha and I have that in common. No fun. That's right. <laughs> only child of divorced parents experience with being one of three children to Ruby D and Ossie Davis. Yeah, it was crazy. Woo, woo. You, hopefully you'll ask a <laughs> Beautiful. question. Beautiful, I'm, 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 I'm getting chills. I'm getting chills, y'all. Woo, that was, that was You're making me sweat, so. <laughs> I, I, wanna, I, I wanna just stick with that thread about the movement for just a little while longer. You know, many of the leaders of the early civil rights movements were, predominantly Black men, right? Including um, your dad, Dominique, and contrasting to today- still on the move, in the movement now. Let's not- Yes, 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 no, no, no. I'm not saying he's not there. <laughs> and so my, my contrast in today with, for example, the Black Lives Matter movement, where it's mostly led by Black women, some of whom identify as queer, I wonder what your thoughts are on this shift in movement. 
A shift in leadership, sorry. I don't think it's a shift. I think it's a continuation. I think it's an involvement and it's a progression. And I think if we think of it as a shift, we're taking away the connectivity that these movements have. You can't have a Black Lives Matter movement without acknowledging, um, you know, SELC and the NAACP and the movements mm -hmm. that they learned from and came before them. So Absolutely. I think it's a continuation of movement. And I am so thrilled. I, Me being a Black woman who grew up in uh, the quote unquote legacy uh, movement, um, I am thrilled to see its involvement. And I'm thrilled to see that so many others um, who are, are not culturally related um, to the struggle have also embraced and accepted and been uh, become advocates in this fight. I think it takes everyone. I think it takes uh, not just uh, one culture, not just one kind, not just one gender, but I think that this is a fight that affects all of us and that includes all of us. And I think that we are now understanding exactly what that means and exactly how all of us and our place um, is so dynamic and impactful um, to fight for the progression of uh, people. Uh, we're, we're just today, you know, we are talking right now, just today, the trial of De uh, Officer Derek Chauvin started, uh, the officer who was accused of murdering um, George Floyd. Uh, my father is in Minneapolis right now with uh, Attorney Crump and the family. Um, I didn't go because I wanted to be here with all of you tonight. Um, but, you know, the, the struggle continues. We are, we are dealing with this right now. Um, and where do we all stand on that? What side of history are you on? You know, so yeah. we can all yeah. now ask that question and we can all now be engaged in that discussion of what that looks like. Whereas before we were not able to have these discussions, we were not able to come to mm -hmm. these tables and discuss and talk about mm -hmm. where we fit in and what we are doing. And so mm -hmm. I think that that now resonates more than ever before. And we mm -hmm. have now more responsibility, okay? Now we have more responsibility because we have so much more influence and so much more activity. Now we have a responsibility to really get change done. And we got to push this for legislation and we've got to continue uh, to advocate in the spaces that we know will resonate our voices um, and, and really progress change that we want to see happen. So that's my time. Thank you. Thank you for that. Please Say jump in. That, you know, I think it's social norms that have changed more than the movement because women were always at the forefront of the movement. Women were always leading and doing a lot of incredible things. They just didn't have the, the news reels and the news cameras on them to post their pictures. And I think also the way in which we look at leadership now is also different. It's more decentralized. There's more people that emerge and take a, a role because there's an opportunity and a place and a space for everyone to shine and to come through and to be of service. Um, but if you look at Angela Davis, if you look at Diane Nash, if you look at uh, Suzanne's mom, if you look at Hesna's mom, you know, I mean, uh, if you look at uh, Dr. Sh uh, Shabazz, I mean, they're all women who led in the movement, you know, and um, it's important not to suggest that it was even solely led by any one leader, right? Because, you know, there were people who were the quote unquote mouthpiece and stood front and center so that there right, was a focal right. point, but it took and was engaged by so many. I mean, you know, uh, Dominique mentioned SCLC and NAACP, and there was also SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. With all that, still people. live. These still that's, organizations are still leading today. Don't get us. Don't get us. That's it. right. They're all still there, and they were led a lot by young people and women. Um, Diane Nash was 17 years old with child when she you know, started to, to, to work on Freedom Summer and all of the other um, things that, that the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee do to try and register people to vote. And so I just think it's important that we contextualize social norms and sort of what was more visible in those days because of the people and the still the same issues who were leading those um, news institutions. Who, who are the people who are in charge of bringing you your news? And there you will see what you are not being told. And yeah. I just want to add also that, you know, as Gina was saying, women have been doing this job of leadership for a long time without the spotlight um, from the women who were the teachers in the all black schools before desegregation. 
they were leaders. And the, the, the women who, uh, some were wives, <clears throat> had the ears of folks like Dr. King, had the ears of other leaders who were at the March on Washington, knowing that they would not be able to speak, but who came and were a part of it, even that Million Man March. The women who took care of the children while the folks were out in the front with the picket lines, those are leaders. Those are leaders because it's, it's, it's as Gina said, how you describe your leaders and where you have your spotlight. Women have been around a long, long time. My grandmother lived to be almost 106. And I was very blessed. Um, at one point, my kids had th five grandparents and she among them. But one of the things uh, she did uh, for me, you know, in, in when I was dealing with my husband, it's like, you know, he doesn't listen. You know, she said, she told me, say it and let it sit. Just go back. And then a day or two later, it will be his idea. And it doesn't matter whose idea it is. The idea, the, the, the point is that, the, that it gets done. That still so happens. My grandmother is just one woman. She had a sixth grade education only. And she's only one woman. So you can imagine the other many women who sided up to someone and say, you know, and made that statement and it came out of somebody else's mouth the next day. Amen. Absolutely. Dorothy Height. Yes, 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 yes. Call in, call in. Harriet Tubman. Yes, call in those ancestors. That's yes, the journey of truth. You can yes. think of women who, had to, who decided yes. to kill their children rather than have them continue in enslavement. Yes, yes. thank you for that. Wow. Ooh. Thank you, Dominique. It is not lost in any of us that today was the first day of the murder trial of the officers that murdered George Floyd. So, you know, sending much love to the family and folks just holding space for George Floyd's family um, there. I'm wondering what are some ways in which folks listening into this conversation can challenge the type of systemic racialized violence against Black people. You know, whether you want to share uh, share some response to students or to staff or to faculty or to community members, like like what? How can we challenge? Keep challenging the system. I answer that one. <laughs> yes, please, Keisha, jump in. My sisters know exactly where I'm going with this one, and and. I think I told you before, so you just gave me an open door to just jump on in for that one. Um, so, <laughs> so I am uh, serving as, so this is where I give my uh, disclaimer and say that I am serving as campaign manager for Alvin Bragg, who's running for Manhattan District Attorney. Um, Manhattan District Attorney is without question the preeminent and most uh, influential DA's office in the country. Um, I'm going to use this, you know, that, office as an example uh, for us to be focusing on, you know, around DA's offices nationwide. Um, but, you know, I, so I'll say, number one, you know, we should all be, and you just had an election last year um, in Los Angeles that Gina was very involved with in terms of helping to elect George Gascon as the Los Angeles district attorney. And you all may have family members that are spread out across the country who should be uh, be focused on paying attention to who is in their DA's office, who is in their sheriff's office, who is in the, the AG's office in the, of their state. Because the, the power that these people possess is extraordinary. It is essentially a, uh, it's an executive office that where that as opposed to legislative offices, um, or frankly, even if you think about the president's office, there are checks and balances that, you know, you have the other branches of government that, 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 um, that uh, counterbalance, if you will, the authority of the executive branch in terms of the president. In the district attorney's office, uh, they decide whether or not to, you know, to uh, charge certain crimes as, 
uh, en masse, like as a whole, and specifically in certain cases, is extraordinary amount of power. The reason, you know, that Alvin is running is because he saw that you had people who were, or their prior DA would charge, you know, a homeless man for, for buying toothpaste and food, at, you know, and recommend that he gets, um, I'm sorry, rep, uh, toothpaste and food with a counterfeit bill, recommending he gets four to eight years in jail and let Harvey Weinstein and Darmini Strauss-Kahn and, and Donald Trump you know, and Jeffrey Epstein all walk free. Um, those are the kinds of decisions that these people make. <laughs> that is the kind of authority that they have. And specifically when we're talking, you know, you, you, you asked about, you know, about the violence against our, our bodies. Yes, there's obviously uh, the kind of violence that we saw in, in the case of George Floyd and so many other cases. Um, but the, but I would argue that the that similarly that the violence against our body in our bodies in the case that I just talked about, where the homeless man was was you know was recommended to go to jail for for four to eight years, that's destroying another person's life. That is violence against his body. That is that you know it and, and we all know what it's rooted to. It's rooted you know it's rooted in this complete. Um, the complete complete lack of humanity that has been assigned to you know our bodies from jump from the second we set foot set foot on this soil. Uh, sorry for the background noise. Um, um, and um, you know, but we have now moved forward four hundred years at four hundred plus years, and it's you know it's we have to possess our power um, in this particular area all across the country and you know the Manhattan DA's office is is, an, is a particularly important office in with in regard to this because of the fact that you have people like Donald Trump who um has a case that's um you know pending out of this office and uh very consequential but it's also um but that that same import in terms of our individual bodies that's that's a nationwide situation in a way that to me if we are really going to be focused on how to combat that, that is one of the ways that we that we all ought to be focusing very locally on our local politics. Come on, yeah. Stacey. Thank you. <laughs> What'd you say? Anyone, and I said, come on, Stacy. I see you. I see yes, you. Yes. <laughs> You've inspired Stacy to yes, share with yes. what you're saying because yes, it's yes. very inspiring. Yes. Local yes. politics. Yes, yes, absolutely. And um you know, forgive me, I had to step away from the conversation. I had some black eyed peas on the stove and they, they overheated. <laughs> <laughs> they overheated. Is that real? All right. <laughs> Is that real black eyed peas? Real black, real black eyed peas, yes. <laughs> so this is not the virtual black eyed peas. No, the real, <laughs> real black eyed peas. When we say it was the virtual, it's the virtual black eyed peas. Yes, I'm happy I'm in New York. I'm coming over, Stacey. Come on, come on. So, so I just want, I, I, we have to Wait. turn to some, sorry, did someone want to say something? I thought Stacey was going to. Yes. Were you going to talk I'll, a little bit I'll, about I'll, I'll, But Kim, it's your show. No, go, 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 go. No, 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 you so, go, go. So really quickly, um, I totally agree with what Keisha um, said. I echo, echo that 1,000%. Um, you know, I worked in city government for close to 10 years, uh, working in the mayor's office. And I saw firsthand how the lack of diversity um, can affect and even harm communities of color, right? So, um, you know, I didn't learn, honestly, Kim, until maybe a few months ago that there's such a thing as external activism, right? That you see more openly, but there has to be an internal activism movement. And that mm -hmm. means electing folks like Alvin, who's running for DA, someone like myself who was inspired to run for city council and others across the country. So that's all I wanted to add. We need judges. We need judges Thank you. too. Judges. Absolutely. Moral judges. and ethical leaders are yes. needed. Yes. And if, if, if anything to say in terms of how do we combat this is that we all have to take a deep, hard look at ourselves. Yes. 
which is what I think Stacy is alluding to. And all of the students that are watching this today and, and anyone who sees it afterward, all their families, you have to be accountable. You have to not judge yourself when you discover your biases. You need to grow from those biases and understand that, you, oh, I thought I was, and then move from that without mm. judgment. Shift and change happens from within and it spreads out. Yep. Boom. Thank you for that. Ooh, that was a mic drop moment. That's exactly. Right. Keisha, That's drop right. the mic. Drop the mic. <laughs> Gina, I'm going to send you some black so, eyes. Come on. <laughs> come on. <laughs> <laughs> so listen you all I have one last question and then I'm going to turn to some questions from the uh, from the audience that are that are that are st stacking up in my chat over here so as we think about this country ravaged by racism and white supremacy acts of ongoing murder of black people right not just George Floyd so many more we are also thriving in our best black girl magic selves right how do you all balance this duality of these elements? That sounds like Suzanne. Yeah, that is <laughs> Suzanne. Suzanne. <laughs> well, I mean, well, we've always really risen from ashes, right? I mean, that's part of what we do as people. But um, this, you know, we this sisterhood was formed for support, right? We're talking about this and we're reflecting out because we want others to understand the importance of your emotional mental, spiritual health when you're doing this kind of work. Um, so Black Girl Magic is because we have the network, the support, you know, and we as women speak to one another. We ask one another, how you doing? <laughs> and, we, and we listen. And so we've had this great, you know, we share resources in this group, which is another beautiful thing about a community, creating community. And so somebody says, you know, you want a therapist? Let's find a therapist. Let's talk to, you know, you need to change your diet because you feel like it's affecting your health. Let's talk about how we, you know, there's always someone in the group or more, one or more, who has some kind of experience with some. That's the beauty of this. We need a good attorney that we can trust. Somebody in the group knows this good attorney. We need someone dealing with intellectual property issues because we all have come from famous families. I mean, somebody in the group knows. I mean, that's why you're stronger together. You know, and so, yes, my, they laugh. They talk to me because I've been like the mental health. Keisha and I talk a lot. We're not, we're not the only ones in the group, but we talk a lot about mental health therapy. We're both first to tell you we had a lot. Of, I've had a lot of therapy and luckily I found a good therapist. and It saved my life. So I advocate for people to look for therapy or an avenue towards that. And then that's a big issue for Gina, too. She's you know, we could all talk about that. And then you're you know what you eat. That's what they all laugh at me. What you eat is very important. What you put in your body, you gotta get up every morning. Um, and I'm, you know, pretty serious about that, vegan and da 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 da. What they fed us, we know this. I'm talking to a group of people in California, so I feel like <laughs> y'all should know. Why are you gonna call, call on California like that? I uh, just you know, you know, probably so like long, that. they referred to the folks in California what, before I moved here. We were all like the tofu avocado people. We were the <laughs> We were the sprout, yeah, the sprout brains. <laughs> no right. hitbox in your greens. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I have to preach a little bit more when I'm, you know, in other parts of the country. But I think in California they know a little bit. But anyway, what you eat and what they offered us, we know that is not what we wanted. What they gave us, what we had to eat back then, that's become part of our traditions. Uh, it doesn't mean we lose the tradition if we shift the food <laughs> over and make, as you say, you know, vegan mac and cheese or whatever, adapt it so that it, it doesn't poison our bodies and be very careful mm -hmm. about what, which industries we support, the meat industry, mm -hmm. you know, I, I could go on and on. This is my, one of my favorite topics, but, <laughs> you know, but it's important to us and it's yeah. part of the violence against our bodies is eating that crap that literally kills you. And when, an, mm -hmm. and when a virus comes around, you find out even more what your immune system cannot handle, you know? So what mm -hmm. we eat, if we're going to fight on all fronts, mm -hmm. let's fight on this front too. What you eat mm -hmm. matters. And think of it as a, a revolutionary act to eat properly. That's how I feel. Right. And also, right. And also to to I'm sorry, go ahead, Hasna. What did you I say? I was just saying to get enough sleep. 
get oh, yes, definitely care care of yourself. <laughs> but I was going to just say also in terms of diet, because um, Suzanne, you just inspired me to think about this, that also um, eating well and eating consciously is also um, a way to support the environment and to understand how much of the food that we eat also is given and brought to us through mechanisms that mess with the environment. And mm -hmm. also, it also is connected to immigration issues. Yeah. Our, um, our laborers who, who have come to this country to support our eating habits, um, but factory farming, I mean, there's a lot that goes into just simply being more conscious about what you're eating. Not only is it good for you inside, but once again, it spreads outside. It's a political act as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and we have to also remember that Black Girl Magic is standing on the shoulders of other Black girls and other Black women who came before us. And if we yes. take into consideration the things that Suzanne and Gina were talking about in, in terms of mental health and physical health and eating clean, uh, it enables us to stand on those shoulders with our legs and our back straight and without teeter-tottering and staying on the course. Yes. So Thank that's you. Black Girl Magic, when you can right. take care of yourself and stand on the shoulders of others without letting them down and prepare yes. to put somebody yes. else on your shoulders. Yes, thank you so much. And so I, 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 I've got to get to a couple of questions from the chat. So maybe you can be the first to respond, Keisha. So I just want to get, I don't know if it's a student or who's writing, but this, this is from Kelly. As daughters of influential civil rights leaders, did you all feel obligated to follow in their footsteps? Anybody no. want to? I actually, well, I can talk to that. Um, I actually went the other way. Um, my dad. Um, well, it's it's a mixture. So I, my sister and I never wanted to be activists. We were like, you know, not that we didn't love what my dad did or loved, you know, the work. Uh, we understood it very well from a very young age, but it just wasn't, we wanted to do, find our own, uh, our own space, our own, uh, our own outlet, our own, you know, everything. So I attracted to the arts. I was creative. Uh, I loved um, acting and producing and, and putting things together and being creative. Um, so that was where I, uh, my track, my sister was uh, a very technical person, uh, she more like she loved sciences and math. So she wanted to go, you know, either a, like a lawyer route or she wanted to be a doctor. Um, but then <laughs> when we went to college and we started getting involved and we started uh, really understanding, again, how we show up, our space um, in the movement and our voice, how intricately important it was um, being young and woke at, you know, <laughs> it was um, it was it was something that we were automatically drawn to. It just does something. It, it brings you. Um, you know, to it, you know, we were drawn but after Trayvon Martin, my sister Ashley started a, a, a youth huddle at the National Action Network where she wanted to provide an outlet for young people to just come and get their get their thoughts off and and learn how to organize and learn how uh, tools uh, for leadership in this space if they were to choose that or wanted to do that. Um, so you just, you, you evolve and you find um, that, you know, things that you've always been a part of, you embrace it eventually and it becomes a part of what you do. Um, and so I'm sure that all of the sisters here, you know, may not have wanted to follow in their parents' footsteps, but they saw their parents in their work um, because they were in, entrenched and involved from such a young age in the work. Um, and so you're just, it just, it just naturally happens. I don't think that no one can say that, you know, that it does it. It's just a natural thing. Um, but again, you can make it your own. And my, one thing my dad always taught me, you know, he, he had learned from Jesse Jackson and James Brown and, you know, he had a very intricate, uh, creative, unique um, upbringing. Um, and he always said, you know, I, I always wanted to be Jesse Jackson. I always wanted to be like Martin Luther King, but I found it more interesting to be the best Al Sharpton I could be. And I always mm -hmm. delivered that no matter That's where great. I go, who I'm connected yes. to, I know who I am and I know who I'm connected to, but I can be the very best Dominique Sharpton anyone has ever seen on this earth. There you yes, go. yes, yes, yes. Love it. Ili Iliasa, were you leaning in to say something? Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I was to mute myself. Like, 
<laughs> Did you want to respond to that about whether or not you felt obligated? Um, well, let's see, as a child, you know, my mother uh, decorated our home with art, books and music that celebrated who we were as women, um, as Muslims, as people of the African diaspora, um, as indigenous first world nations. And, and so, you know, um, I remember when uh, I discovered this family was going to Africa and how alarmed I was. I was about six or seven years old and I thought, oh my gosh, they're going to Africa. I was watching Tarzan. And it was around that time that my mother got a tutor um, for a Sheikh Tafik. <laughs> And he would teach us a history about, um, uh, you know, the African diaspora, about religion. Um, he would teach us Arabic. But what captivated me the most was our storytelling time. And he would provide these beautiful, wonderful stories about Queen Nzinga, about, um, you know, the, the uh, uh, pyramids, just all of these really rich dynamic stories. And, and so for as young, young as I can remember, I would write stories and plays and musical productions. And I would use my sisters, my younger sisters, of course, and my school friends as the cast. And, and my stories were always rich and vibrant. And you know, when I went to uh, high school, I was mentoring kids and discovering you know, that there was just this emptiness. And when I went to college, again, mentoring kids and seeing this emptiness. And, you know, I started to, to discover what it looks like when we control the narrative of our own mm -hmm. time, right? Yeah. My father said only a fool would sit back and allow his enemy to teach his children, right? And we know about slavery, mm -hmm. we know about all of these things. So we should understand that African-American history, for example, is American history, right? Yeah. And that American history is also um, Hispanic and Asian and, you know, so many other indigenous um, kinds of histories. And so if we control the narrative of slavery, we could say that it was these um, refined and industrious African people who were enslaved against their will. And in spite of that, they cultivated a land and turned this land into the land of milk and honey. And mm -hmm. had it not been for them, we would not have the, no one would have the opportunity to call the United States of America their home. And, and, and that's what it looks like when we control the narrative with truth, right? And mm -hmm. um, even when we look at the massacres of Black Wall Street in Tulsa and Rosewood, for example, if these kinds of things were taught in high school uh, U.S. history classes to be as American as the Boston Tea Party, then we would understand the necessity of reparations. We'd understand um, oh, the importance of providing a value system for our children without teaching hate, racism, discrimination, but instead teaching love and respect and all of these mm -hmm. other things. And, you know, and I had this, this thing here that even if we consider um, the 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 empires of Africa, right? The empires the, of Mali, of Benin, of Ghana, all these wonderful rich empires. If we learned about them in the same way that we learned about Greece, ancient Greece and ancient Rome, then we'd have a better appreciation for the cradle of civilization for all of mankind. Yes. Right. Yes. And we'd have a we'd have an opportunity to instill Absolutely. Um, no. Yeah. Kim, if that doesn't answer your question. Oh, Lord. <laughs> There's Malcolm <laughs> and Betty combined right there. Yeah. Malcolm and Betty so combined. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. So I am so grateful that my parents challenged systemic racism and they spoke about the necessity of our education curriculum being inclusive and based on facts. Right. Yes. And I'm so grateful that this is the kind of tutelage that I received as a child that with, along with my five sisters, um, that this is the kind of tutelage, you know, that we were provided that I went to white schools, you know, and some people criticize that. But my mother wanted to make sure we had a quality education. But she also made sure that while we were home, we understood who we were as women as people of the diaspora, of first world nations, indigenous people, and as Muslims. And these are supposed to be everything on the, on the bottom of the totem pole that someone placed there for their own purpose. 
And, and, and so I think when you understand that and you have a healthy sense of yourself, then you see yourself as a reflection of others and you're willing to jump in like each of us sisters to address the injustices that we come across. Yes, I just have to say that as a mom of a 14 year old high schooler right now, it, it, it hurts my heart when I think about the fact that in order to get a good education, he has to go to a predominantly white school. Like, why can't all the schools be equally, you know, balanced? I mean, it, it's not that hard. And so that's a fight that we have in Long Beach. That's a fight that we have in many different cities across the country that the better neighborhood schools are the, you know, are predominantly white and those are the better schools. And so what does that say about all the other schools and all the other children, you know? You know, but Dr. Bettina Love said this at a conference. She said, you know, Black children aren't valued. And they know that. And they feel that. And they see that. You know, and that just, yeah, anyway, I I, I, I'm going to leave that. I think it's changing, though. I think it's changing. And you know, I hope so. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> changing. I think that people are understanding the truth in history, right? Yeah. And, and, and that there is... Um, a movement that's driving our nation um, towards mm -hmm. a more civilized space, mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm. and, and thank God for, you know, thank God for women. Thank God for lots of people. But let, uh, right now we're going to thank God for the women. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thank God for women, yes. Because <laughs> yes. I'm seeing all women so on the screen. Let me, let, me, let, me, for the sisterhood. let me get to a question from Omar. Omar said, I come from a community designed for the failure of our youth. Our black and brown youth are conditioned mentally to hate each other for numerous reasons. How can we com combat this and the problem of gang violence? What do we say to Omar? Oh, well, I'm gonna again say, I'm gonna underscore our education curriculum, right? Because you know, you've got people fighting for land, fighting for turf, right? This gang against that gang fighting for this turf and that turf, well, we don't even own the land, right? So I think that again, when we, when we highlight um, the truth in our education, right? When we take responsibility to ensure that our children are learning the truth, right? Then there's no question about, am I good enough, right? We know that we are. And I, 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 and, and, you know, and I think that that was something that probably each, uh, each sister uh, said, I think that in addition to our formal education, um, it's going to be important, Omar, for everyone to be a mentor, not everyone, but folks who have that frame of mind who want to uplift to be a mentor, to be an example, to live your life and influence your, the, your environment in a positive way that makes it attractive for a young person to want to engage with you. And while they have the uh, disposition or the body language that they aren't listening or they don't want to hear it, they do hear it and they see it. They see what we do. They see how we behave. And on an individualized basis, I think it's important to create environments where young folks feel included, where they see themselves and where they see good examples, examples of good behavior and good thought processes. And the, the, for the um, mentors among us, the elders among us to, to teach them and to mentor them. And I'm gonna pass it to you, Gina, because you know, your dad did a wonderful thing with gangs, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, thank you. Thank you, Hesna. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to just sort of put it into also a, a different context because, you know, when like Ray Ray on the block is trying to get to school and has to walk through and navigate the area based yeah. upon the kind of pressure that might be on him or her, um, there is uh, there isn't this sense there is there is no sense of entitlement there is no sense of um, seeking someone to listen to I mean you know when, when you think about poverty and what that has done to so many families when you think about mass incarceration school to prison pipeline juvenile justice when you think about all of these systems 
I will say that what my sisters have been saying around education is key because when you work with a person who does not have a clue of the, their own value, who has been told over and over again that they ain't shit, they ain't going to amount to nothing, that either their a family member is incarcerated or a family member is a drug addict that that's supposed to be responsible for them. By the time they get to school and having to navigate other circumstances on the block, they get to school and they're a little late and they get in the class and then the teacher is coming down on them. I mean, that's a lot before 8.30 in the morning. And that person often wants to just say, and excuse my language, but they just want to say, fuck it. And they want to go out and they want to drink a beer or smoke a joint and just be like, fuck all y'all. And so I think what we need to look at is the holistic issue and the holistic problem of poverty and the criminalization of, pro of poverty yeah. and how we can in encourage young people. I'll, I'll give you an example. So we have a program that we work with another organization called Creative Acts. We went into juvenile hall during the pandemic with uh, virtually and we, we taught a course on civics. We wanted to, and it was a very exciting course that maybe, I don't know, 12 young men um, in, in my class, but we did it over like a seven week period. So there were multiple classes, mm. um, you know, some, and they're all incarcerated, these child prisons. And we knew that some of these kids that were inside, they're gonna get out. So what can we help them to know because their vote counts, right? So we gave them a civics lesson. And what we learned is that 100% of the young men that we taught, 100% of them voted. And they voted because they understood the value of their voice and that the choices that they could make in electing people in their community, whether it was the judge or the district attorney, as we spoke about earlier, that they had a voice to say, who represents my issues? Who is going to stick up for me? What board of education person am I going to put and elect in there who is going to change the curriculum for me so I can learn about the history of my people? And so the more we empower young people through education to understand that their voice matters, then they will find a way to navigate their neighborhoods and their and their circumstances and their early childhood experiences and not just leave their communities to become fabulous, amazing contributors, but actually stay in their communities yeah. to help those communities also grow and flourish. And we have to break these cycles of poverty. Yeah, mm -hmm. and I just wanna add to what Gina said really quickly, um, you know, we need to really reimagine what society looks like, right? I think we invest in the wrong things and objects instead of people. And um, the and elect Bear agrees with you. That's there Bear. you go. That's my baby, Bear. Um, <laughs> like, right on, right on. Exactly. Oh, exactly. My auntie. Exactly. <laughs> oh, man. Exactly. <laughs> And, um, you know, it's time for those that are elected to start investing in communities that have been disenfranchised for so long, right? And it's not just about setting up programs, but I mean, like changing households, neighborhoods, and communities so that a young man doesn't even have to think about joining a game, right? that there are opportunities available to him and her at a very, very early age, you know? So I think um, it's on us to really turn the tables here and invest mm -hmm. in, in these mm -hmm. communities in a very mm -hmm. real way. And elevate women. When you elevate women, you will elevate the entire community. Women, children, yes. men, across the board. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's agreeing with you. He, he, yeah, he's that's agreeing right. with you. That's right. That's right. <laughs> So ladies, we are we are almost at time and, and I just want to say how can people follow you and your work on the social? Feel free to share your ID or if you want people to find you on their own. Um, anybody want to shout out their ID or how, how can you be found? Well, we have a website mm -hmm. uh, that we 
really proud of that we're launching in like two days, but it's there, it's there for you all to see. It's uh, www.daughtersofthemovement.com. And there you can find each of us and our social media handles um, individually, but also Excellent. join us on our IG page of Daughters of the Movement and you know, follow us. Um, you know, certainly share your contact information with us so that we can keep you in our, you know, MailChimp going forward and let, you know, let you know where else you can find us. And, you know, we've got a lot of things and exciting things going on in the works. There is a new social app, an audio app, if you don't already know it called Clubhouse, and we're launching our club on the 31st. So you can find us on Clubhouse as well. And Daughters of the Movement. Man, y'all are some hip sisters. Clubhouse, <laughs> you know, we're, we are okay. Current. We are okay. Current. Um, well, yeah. So, okay. Well, Daughters of the Movement.com. Daughters of the Movement.com. Thank you. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Keisha, Suzanne, Stacy, Hesna, Dominique, Ilyasa, for this rich and juicy conversation. We are all mentally and spiritually full from listening to your brilliance. Parts of our conversation tonight reminded me of something Keisha's grandfather, Percy Sutton said. He said, um, suffer the hurts, but don't show the anger because if you do, it will block you from being able to effectively do anything to remove the hurt. I know that many of us black, brown, Asian, indigenous people live with the memory and pain of gener generational trauma caused by white supremacy and colonization. So we must find sustainable ways to interrupt the trauma and decolonize our thinking and our being. We must find ways to care for ourselves in a way that Audre Lorde refers to as self-preservation. And that looks different for each of us. We talked about eating right, exercise, napping, finding a sisterhood. For me, it's teaching my Black girl magic yoga class, right? Or spending time at the beach with my son watching him surf. So you know, as an activist and an educator, I have to end with a call to action, right? So I have three. My first call to action for those of you listening is to get curious about yourself and interrogate what you need to do for your own self-preservation because that is how we get to freedom and liberation. Some of us have heard the phrase, hurt people hurt people. Well, I challenge you to replace that with heal people heal people. My second call to action is to get curious with your circle of friends and family and talk openly about ways you are all interrupting anti-Blackness and supporting Black and other people of color. And my third call to action is to join a local organization and get involved in your community. Whatever your interest is in, racial justice, environmental justice, healing justice, find a group of people, a local organization that you can be of service to, and continue to interrupt anti-Blackness and white supremacy in your own cities. We have had over 200 Black people murdered after George Floyd was murdered. So we still have a lot of work to be done. So I hope you got those students and staff and faculty and community members and probably my mom watching. Self-preservation, <laughs> community care, local engagement. I'm gonna close with a simple and yet powerful words from Harry Belafonte. He said, each and every one of you has the power, the will, and the capacity to make a difference in the world in which you live. Thank you, Daughters of the Movement, and thank you to the community for witnessing us tonight. As we slowly emerge from sheltering in place, stay connected to the earth, stay connected to our ancestors, stay connected to your community, and stay connected to yourself. Stay safe, and good night, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thank Peace and blessings. You. Peace and blessings.